Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to meet Dr. Steven Shavira. I, this guy is awesome. I, I've known him since 2018. We go back a long way. The guy's awesome. He, um, he, he, we first met in Cory Bernardi's Christ, um, Australian Conservative Party back in the 2019 election. And the guy's had a profound impact on me. And I really want to share him with you guys because he does not have a big enough following um, compared to what he has. Like the knowledge that he's accrued over the last few years is like it makes me look very cute and you guys you guys look up to me with all this knowledge and you know you ask for advice and this and that I'm nothing this guy's amazing he's been doing this for like 30 years and he's an absolute legend so I'm gonna bring him in right now and you're gonna meet him and I, he's amazing I, I love the guy he's awesome so let's see if we can uh, see where Dr. Steven Shavira is and uh, he's not usually on Instagram but I'm trying to get him on normally he's on uh, Twitter the Twitter sphere, but um, I want to see if I can get him on here a little bit more permanently because he's, he's got a lot of knowledge, especially when it comes to what's going on with the constitution. And I think you guys are going to absolutely love it. Let me, let me bring in turning point at least. And that way we can pump the, uh, the views a bit. This is going to be great. Where are you, Stephen? You guys are going to love this. He, he's a great guy. So this isn't him, this is Turning Point. There we go. Stephen, where are you? Where are you? I need you, I need you in here now. There he is, we've got him. This is going to be great. Um, oh God, it, it, there's a lot to talk about. And um, if we're going to get out of this mess, he's got a lot of answers we need. Steven Shavira is unable to join. Why is that? You've got to click accept, Stephen. It's all right. In a, in, a, in a little while, he's going to be an expert at this. It's going to be great. There he is. <laughs> hey, guys. Sorry, a few, few tech issues here. No, um, let, let, me, let me introduce you properly, uh, Doctor. I've, I've, already, um, I've already introduced you a second ago, just informally, but... Stephen Shavira, he's a historian and regular public commentator. He's written many articles for The Australian and The Spectator Australia, as well as a recent book by Sir Robert Menzies and founder of the Liberal Party. Stephen is a senior lecturer in, the hist in, the hist in history at Campion College, Sydney. Thank you for you know, taking the time to meet me. And uh, I was telling the, um, the guy, Stephen, that uh, we go back to 2018. We, um, you know, we met at one of Cory Bernardi's events, and that was sort of where the conservative movement was. And uh, yeah, I think I first saw you on conversations with John Anderson and you've had a profound impact on, um, on my understanding of politics and sort of helping me understand what's going on. I just want to welcome you to the show. Well, it's an honor to be here, Joel, and thank you for those very kind words. And uh, I love what you, you do. And, and uh, yes, I, I remember that, um, that conference with Corey Bernardi very well. I remember that's when we first met and you were, you, you sort, of, sort of said you wanted to start getting into public commentary and that was sort of you sort of starting off and here you are now. It's, it's just fantastic to see how well you've done and to see the good things that you're doing. I think you're having a real impact, Joel. So congratulations on all of that. Uh, th thank you for saying that. Um, I, it's, there's a lot to do, obviously, and um, I, I see this truly in the Christian sense, a body of God sort of working together in concert. And um, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And just to put things into perspective, guys, and I, I don't want to pump your, your, your tires up too much, Stephen, but it's deserved. You, a lot of people, they look to me for political advice. A lot of them, they, they're like, you know, um, how, do, how do I vote? How does this how to vote card stuff work? How does you know, the democracy work. What is the first and second and third reading of a bill? And they just don't understand. And I knew things were really bad in the country when they started turning to a guy that was in construction for eight years for answers. And I was like, guys, I'm not even an expert because I know I'm not an expert because I meet people like you, Augusto Zimmerman, um, uh, Professor David Flint, who nominated Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, um, and yeah, and yeah, and like I just, I, I'm so keen to get you off the Twitter sphere because you are surrounded over there. It's an absolutely <laughs> nightmare. How do you survive yeah. there? Oh, uh, b barely actually. Uh, I, I, one of one of the things I've really enjoyed lately is actually getting onto um, Telegram. Uh, and my my videos do better on Telegram than they do on Twitter and on and on. And on the dreaded Facebook, they're just totally suppressed. It's unbelievable. Um, yeah. So 
uh, and I'm uh, actually I seem to be doing okay on um, on Instagram as well. But twi Twitter is a very very nasty place. I mean, Facebook's pretty nasty, but Twitter Twitter is a very nasty place uh, where friendships mm. are lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> enemies are made it's, it's incredible yeah. but it's lovely to i've been on uh, instagram not for very long i've made about 10 posts so far uh, so yeah. uh, i'm very i'm very pleased to be on your show no like it's a pleasure to have you here your um instagram's a very friendly uh platform compared to twitter um and oh, facebook not... as well uh conservatives they're pretty they're pretty good on there as well in terms of outnumbering people but um yeah, yeah i forgot to say also uh one of the co-authors of the cancel culture the left's long march through the institutions. That is the key, guys, right here. The long march is a question that I've been trying to answer since I got involved in politics. It was when, when Jordan Peterson was in Sydney, that was the question I asked him. I had one question, and it was how do we reverse the long march through the institutions? Because it's, it's absolutely insane. But, um, Stephen, yeah. let's, get, let's get into it. You're a his historian first and foremost. You're, you're a wealth of knowledge. What was it that sort of, you know, got you interested in this? And how is it that you can utilize that to enact politics? Yeah, well, I mean, as you say, I'm a historian. So what, why have I become so interested in these lockdowns and, and these vaccine mandates and things like that? I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm always interested, you know, roughly in what's going on in this country and, and around the world and particularly in America. Uh, but, you know, you know, I, I remember I remember in early 2020, I was literally about to go over to America um, and I was with a good friend and she said to me, there's this new virus going around. And she said, 20% um, of people who get it wind up in hospital and 20% who wind up in hospital die. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this is huge. And anyhow, I went over to America. Uh, I was there for about 10 days. In fact, the Americans were, were more interested at that time talking about the Australian bushfires and the impeachment of Donald Trump. And uh, anyhow, when I got back to Australia, talk sort of resumed about sort of this, this COVID thing and, and what was taking place in Italy. Uh, and so I sort of became interested in it then, like everyone else. But, but most recently, Joel, I've been writing a lot about it and um, posting a lot of short videos about it. And, and a lot of that actually goes back to one event which really changed me. And it was about um, five or six weeks ago, maybe two months ago, I can't exactly remember, but our, our, one of our neighbours actually came to our door. We hadn't seen it in weeks and we were in lockdown at the time. Uh, but she came to our door and, and said that for three weeks she'd been having really serious adverse effects from her vaccine. And... She said, I think her, her adverse effects were something like this, that, that, that she got the vaccine and almost immediately she kind of lost feeling and got numb in like half of her body. And then after the numbness went, an excruciating pain took over half of her body and she went to the hospital and they said it's definitely from the, from the vaccine. And, and she said, you know, it'll pass, don't worry. And, and, it, and it did actually pass, but for, for three weeks, she was either numb or in excruciating pain, not knowing what was going to happen. And, it was, and, and that was around the time when the vaccine mandates were starting to become pretty serious, when lots of workers were being told, you've got to get these, man you've got to get these vaccines if you want to stay employed. And I started thinking to myself, my goodness, if, and I actually looked a bit into it and I saw that up until that point, there had been about 50,000 adverse reactions registered in Australia. Um, and I also had read elsewhere that probably only about a, a small percentage of a adverse reactions actually ever get reported. And so I thought to myself, well, if 50,000 have actually been reported, how many more adverse reactions are there out there, like my friends, and, and even worse? And I started to think to myself, I mean, because my background is sort of in the history of politics and, and political theory, which asks questions like, why do we have governments? What do governments have a right to, ex to demand that we do? What do governments have a right to coerce us to do? So they, they have a right to, to tax us. Um, you know, they have a right to punish us if we actively harm other people. And I thought to myself, you know, you've got government departments put, laying down these mandates for people to get these vaccines, and you've got a lot of sort of bis private businesses and corporations laying down these mandates. And I thought, 
should governments and should employers really have the right to tell people they've got to take these vaccines knowing what the effects are for many, many people uh, on the, at the cost of these people losing their jobs if they don't comply? So for me, this whole thing has always been a political question. Like, does the government really have the right to tell people they have to take these vaccines, uh, particularly given the, the adverse reactions I've seen? But, 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 but also, you know, Joel, I and many people, probably most people, are ve am very, very close to people who have serious chronic health issues. And those chronic health issues are not, are not necessarily that doesn't necessarily make them more vulnerable to COVID, but my friends very much fear that their chronic health issues might make them more susceptible to, to vaccine um, adverse effects. Which, mm. and, and the, but the problem is the, the exemptions for vaccine, to, to get the vaccines are so unbelievably narrow that these kinds of people who would legitimately have said, you know something, I'd rather not get the vaccine and I'm just gonna be really careful about COVID, they're not allowed to do that. And I just got thinking to myself, wow, like, does the government really have the right to enforce that? So that's really how I got started on it. And, and just one more thing, Joel. Uh, um, the first post I ever posted on these mandates on Facebook, I, I, I told the whole story that I just told you about my friend. And all I said was, wow, guys, like, this is like pretty serious stuff. The government's saying you've got to take these. And, and I said, is, is that right? And let me tell you, Joel, I had people basically writing to me saying, how dare you bring this up? You're discouraging people from getting vaccinated. You're spreading false information. People are going to die because of you. And, and at that point, I really just thought to myself, like something has taken a grip of people in this country. And, and since then, you know, like you, Joel, and like many others, I've been talking about it. Well, that's what I want to delve into because you're you're in a very educated crowd, obviously, and the people you are rubbing shoulders with, they're the, let's call the intelligentsia of the country. Now, we, you know, speaking to a historian, we know what the intelligentsia thought in Germany. We know that, you know, Hitler's cabinet happened to be, um, what, I think they had the most PhDs and, uh, between them and they're the, 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 the most educated Well-educated, yeah. Um, Well-educated. I think Trump had the most, uh, well, the wealthiest cabinet, though. Um, but I, I think... I think it's really interesting to see what they're thinking. It reminds me, it's funny, I keep talking about John Anderson. There was a segment he did with 20, in 2018 with um, Peter Hitchens. It was the first one that sort of kicked me in the gear yeah. where he said, you know, if courage is the ability to, you know, um, sorry, what did he say? He said, if wisdom is the ability to understand consequences and courage is the ability to act on those consequences, why are there not more educated people, professors in the university speaking up. Like, I mean, you're rubbing shoulders with these people. What's going on in their minds? That's, 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 that's not an easy question to answer. To, to be honest, Joel, I have a feeling that there probably are a lot out there who are getting uncomfortable with what's going on in Australia. I really do think that. Um, although having said that, um, you know, um, you know, intellectuals, Joel, are notoriously conformist. That they they sort of they often like to sort of portray themselves as being free thinking and bohemian and and that sort of thing. But in actual fact, maybe compared to the average person on the street, they they think very very differently. But within the context, often of of a university, there is a very very strong. Uh, impulse among intellectuals to basically not stray too much from one another on certain issues that, you know, if you sort of strayed on them, you would be considered either stupid or, you know, wicked and immoral. And so, like, the psychology of, of the average intellectual is that basically the worst thing that you can ever be is considered unintelligent by other intellectuals. It, it's a kind of form of, of, of death for an intellectual. And that's right. why when a, when a particular way of thinking, whether it's a kind of catastrophic climate change way of thinking, or if it's sort of the diversity cult kind of thinking, or if it's basically a kind of uh, 
COVID mania, which is, is really gripping the world, once that starts to take hold in an institution full of intellectuals, what happens over time is that it becomes more and more difficult to express contrary views because the more it kind of takes hold, and it's, it usually takes hold because of, at first, a few vocal people are, are, are sort of are very active about it, and then other people kind of fall into line. It just gets to the point where if you do actually say something fairly dissenting, uh, you, you're basically considered an outsider. Uh, and, and, and again, the worst thing you could be considered among intellectuals, a, a, a pseudo-intellectual. Uh, but but you, I mean, you raised a, a very important question earlier, Joel, and that is sort of that, that long march through the institutions. And, and, and that, is, that is something that really has happened. And, and it's probably something that, that can't be reversed, but that doesn't mean that it has to continue to have the effect that it has, because these days we can start our own institutions. We've got one of the great things of the modern world. We've got the internet where we can basically find our own content. We don't have to rely on our, on our sort of tenured intellectuals to, to understand things. There are lots of brilliant people all around the world giving us content, which is fantastic. And, and Jordan Peterson, I'm a massive fan, and he, he's, he's brilliant on all of this. But uh, yeah, u universities are not exactly known for diversity of opinion on certain issues within the universities, as much as they would like to maybe deny that. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that we're, we're seeing the death of the university? Like, do you think that, I mean, what's going to replace them? I mean, Jordan Peterson, it's been really interesting seeing how his thoughts have been evolving over time. And for, for, the, for the people that are listening, why are we talking about universities? It's because it's the factory of all bad ideas that we've seen in the last hundred years, basically. We've, we, you know, in America, um, the organization Turning Point Australia was started to combat that because it was in the universities. It was started about eight or nine years ago by Charlie Kirk. Right now in Australia, Turning Point's here at a time when the long march is everywhere. It, it's absolutely riddled. You know, if this was a cancer, you know, patient, it would be, be we'd be talking about how to, you know, ease their pain before they die. It's that bad, yeah. guys. Um, and we need a long march of our own. And I think I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing, you know, in society right now, because I feel like this pandemic, it's been a real opportunity to sort of revivify the old values of the past, whether that's the importance of community or family or whatever. I mean, seeing those, seeing that over 10,000 people up at Tweed Heads yesterday was absolutely amazing. And I just saw a community come together around a guy named, you know, uh, Ken Graham Hood, but they were there because it was that sense of belonging. Um, those are the things that really give me encouragement because I, we've been, by the time elections come around, we would have been campaigning for like a year. Look, are, are the universities doomed? Well, you know, the university, often when we talk about the problems in the universities, we're referring mainly to humanities departments, uh, not necessarily to science departments, which are, are still doing wonderful work. Um, and, and, you know, one thing I would hasten to say is that, you know, my university years were fantastic. I loved university. All my lecturers pretty much were Marxists, but they were very sort of fair minded people. I learned a lot. And there are many, many wonderful, brilliant academics in universities. The problem is there are also a lot of rat bags. There are also a lot of people who cannot handle dissenting opinions. And very often, these are the sorts of people who are very, very vocal, who get uh, positions in management in universities, and they just wreck the university. So when I talk about the universities being really ruined uh, from an ideological perspective, that doesn't mean that all the lecturers uh, are rat bags. They're not. They're, they're wonderful ones. But there are enough rat bags in the universities to really... Uh, turn them uh, sort of away from the exciting learning experience that they ought to be and basically turning them into seminaries of leftist, of a leftist priesthood. Um, but but the, the good news is that we, you know, we're able to start our own institutions. And this is what Roger Scruton said. He said, you know, here in the West, we've still got the sacred right of freedom of association, which means we can start our own institutions. We can start our own intellectual clubs. We can publish our own books and still keep a vibrant intellectual life. My prediction for humanities departments, to be honest, is that probably over time, they'll, they'll basically just go bankrupt. I think over time, they'll just lose money, lose funding, and, and they'll be...
sort of continued, continually hollowed out while other institutions like my one, Campion College, continue to do well. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that over time, um, yeah, you're right. We need to make sure the free market can sort of do its work. But the big problem is government, isn't it? We're worried the government's going to be like, oh, you know, uh, we're going to save the universities. Or um, we might even see the problems where the Chinese Communist Party continue to influence our democracies. Um, and all of that. But I, I want to come back to the, um, I want to bring things yeah. back to the pandemic. Yeah. What's going on in this country? We're seeing a lot of things go against the constitution, the right for freedom of association, not association, that's not the language, the right to, to engage in commerce or intercourse or move across mm. um, state lines. Yeah. What is going on? What, did, did, the, did the whole government get amnesia? I mean, did we just completely forget what made this country great and what we have all agreed on as a few states? Can you, can you shed some light here? Because I'm a bit worried that there's a lot of people weighing in on these constitutional issues that don't actually have much of an understanding. Well, I mean, the, the, the best guy, I, I don't know if you've interviewed him on the Constitution, would be someone like Augusto Zimmerman. But I, I can talk. Yeah, on great. Thursday, well, you know something? You know, something for constitutional issues, um, I think I might leave that uh, to my good friend Augusto. He's one of the country's experts. But just in terms more broadly, in terms of what's going on, you know, have, have, have Australians forgotten about sort of the liberties being one of the things that made us great? Um, uh, I, to be honest, uh, I, probably to some extent, yes, t I, I think. And I think there is a kind of apathy um, that has gripped many in Australia, not everyone, but, but many. And, and I, I think, sadly, we're, we're turning into just a, a very, very comfortable country where as long as we're now sort of able to do our shopping and go to the pub, um, we, we more or less do what the government tells us to do. And, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not opposed to obeying governments. I'm not an anarchist or anything like that. Uh, but it, it's amazing to think of where Australia is now uh, compared to where it was two years ago. I mean, w when COVID first hit, I remember people saying this could lead to vaccine passports. And I, and I was just thinking to myself, well, that's just conspiracy thinking. That's that. And I even did an interview and, and, and the guy in the interview said, do you think COVID will change us indefinitely? And I, I remember at the time saying, no, no, no. How wrong was I? You know, I, um, so no, look, I think what, what, what's happened Joel, and, and it sort of goes back to my early experience that, that the, I, I think w we've become very much gripped by two things, neither of which are, 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 are good in general to be gripped by, and that is fear and apathy. And so I think fear has sort of allowed governments to overstep the, the sort of the, the line in terms of interfering in our lives uh, and, and really restricting liberties, but, but also doing other things that, that one really has to wonder whether they are necessary, like pulling kids out of school um, yeah. you know, sh and, and, and the rapidity and ease with which certain borders were shut. Uh, and I think sort of we, we became gripped by fear. And, and I think that goes back right to the early days of the pandemic when um, you know, as you recall, the World Health Organization in, you know, February, March 2020 said that the death rate is 3%. And, and that's pretty high. Um, yeah. And then at the same time, we saw what was going on in, in I think, northern Italy. You, you, you just had mm. thousands upon thousands of, of, of elderly people dying. Now, we since learned that the, the medical treatment that they were being placed in was killing them, that, that, that they didn't know exactly how to treat this and that they're were, they were doing it very badly, no fault of their own, we, you know, they didn't know. But, the, 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 but the, the situations that we're really paying attention to, and another one was China, we'd literally see footage of, of, of you know, there, was, there were bodies piled up, there, there were people um, um, being uh, welded in, into their homes. And so we saw all this f footage, and, and we heard the, the World Health Organization's um, uh, figures and, uh, you know, I think what happened is that, that, that Australians and politicians uh, kind of got really, really spooked and got gripped by fear. But unfortunately, what, what doesn't seem to have happened is that once we start to learn more about it and get a more, much more nuanced view of this virus, 
we didn't seem to really change our tactic all that much. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, what is going on in Australians have never been, um, Joel, Australians have never been known for being particularly enthusiastic about liberty. The things that we have tended to be enthusiastic about in, in Australia historically, Joel, are equality, the fair go, and, 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 and public services, governments doing stuff for us, governments giving stuff to us. You, you don't often hear Australians, um, mainstream Australians, talking a lot about liberties. It's, it's just not part of us, unlike America and unlike France, and so there are a bunch of things sort of feeding into this. But, but like I said, and I got a, into a little bit of trouble for saying this, but I do think there is a, a, a real apathy among Australians about all of this. And, and, and that, that, that kind of fits with our character as well, because what is our national catchphrase almost? Like, mm. it's, she'll be right. She'll be right, yeah. And she'll be right. And you know something? Um, when you're kind of getting low on gas at the barbecue and you think that it'll make it, she'll be right. That'll cut it. That's cool. But, you know, when it comes to governments locking us in our houses and, and putting vaccine mandates on the table and, and, and denying us the, the, the liberties that, that really define a liberal democratic country, she'll be right yeah. is just a, a really bad mantra to bring into that sphere. The history of she'll be right, are you, are you familiar with it? No, I'm not. That's a, oh, okay. I, don't know, I don't know when that was first coined. Um, this, will be the first, this will be the first time I'll, I'll school you in something then. Um, yeah, sitting here with oh, good. Story, and this is going to be weird. Um, good. So I, from what I've heard, this, maybe this is wrong. Fact check me, guys. But it goes back to the rats of Tobruk. So in World War I, when the Australians and the New Zealanders and the British were holding um, the port uh, over there in Tobruk, it was... It was a vital port in North Africa, and they could not lose it. If they lost it, they lost the continent. And um, there was a really feared general over there called uh, Rommel, and he has an amazing quote of respect for the Australians and the New Zealanders, the Anzac soldiers, which went something like this. If I was to take hell, I'd use the Australians to take it and the New Zealanders to hold it. I mean, this guy was throwing everything he had at these rats of Tobruk. That's what he called them. Because he had tanks, he had, he had everything. He was throwing everything he had. He was well supplied. And these people, these, these Anzac soldiers, they were just outnumbered, outgunned, everything. They just dug in and they hung in there. And they, when they were there and they were working hard, they said, she'll be right. Like, get on with it. You know, don't complain, just do it. That is not what, how we use it today. That no, that's not right. not how we use it at all. She'll be right. It's, it, I agree. It's become a phrase of apathy where we just sort of, you know, you know, just put it under the carpet sort of thing. It's like, no, yeah. that's not how you solve problems. It'll fester. Yeah. This wound will fester that you've just cut open, and it's going to be worse than before. You're going to have to amputate the leg. Like, mm. I agree with you 100%. And this is a problem that we're seeing across the West, whether it's the UK, Canada, New Zealand, or America. Um, apathy. We've become lazy, fat, and ignorant of how democracy works. And, you know, that's why I respect you so much because you're, with, through your books, you're constantly trying to educate people uh, and through, and through your, um, your videos on how your democracy actually works so people can be empowered to get the change they want. And that's not partisan. That's empowering people to get what they want. You know, I, um, a few weeks ago, I was very distressed to learn that only half a percent of eligible voters in New South Wales are registered to a political party. I said, half a percent? Are you serious? And what does that mean, guys? If you're in a political party, you're picking who candidates are, you're voting on what policy is, everything. And if you're not in a political party, you have no control over that. So we're, it's worse than being ruled by the 1%. We're being ruled by the less than, less than 1%, half a percent. So we need to re-educate people and because we've become apathetic. We've had a very good run for such a long time. Yes, after that's the what's Second important. That's exactly. what's important, Joel. You hit the nail on the head. We've had it so good. And, 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 and of course, neither of us are advocating that we want another war. I mean, as, as, as the saying goes, war is hell. 
War is only glorious to those who haven't been. Right? We're not, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is something that historians have spoken about since the ancient world. Livy was asking, why is the Roman Republic crumbling? Why, do, what, why is corruption taking over? And he said, because the Romans, the Roman citizens have lost their stern sense of morality. They've lost their concern for religion and for the right. Why? Because they became prosperous. And when they yeah. became prosperous, they stopped caring about everything else. And, and Robert Menzies, Joel, he warned us about this in the 1940s. For Menzies, yeah, communism was a threat. But Menzies also thought another big threat is just becoming apathetic through prosperity, just yeah. only caring what's on Netflix, is there enough Cooper's beer in the fridge, and, uh, what, and yeah, who's playing footy next week? Um, and, yeah. and you know something, in, in some ways, to, to, it's a luxury to be apathetic, to be in a country where you can, where you can just, when you only have to care about that. You've got a history of, of family coming from war-torn areas. Ha, you know, my father's side of the family, uh, he was born in Poland. She was born in the Ukraine. I don't need to tell you what they went through in the 30s and 40s, you know. But a, a lot of people don't appreciate that it, it, there will there could be a time when in actual fact apathy becomes deadly and and, and in fact that the, there will be more things to worry about than what's on netflix tonight yeah exactly my kitchen rules or something like that i um i had an amazing lecturer in university in my last year he was named his name was professor garrick small and the guy is amazing he he has a very good understanding of history as well and this is why I love historians so much because it's like these people have the answers possibly to how the future is going to play out because history is just the same people making, it, it's different people making the same mistakes. And when you work the patterns out, you can be like, oh, okay, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So we're going to see a situation where this is how the landscape is. If this and this happens, maybe this will happen. It, it's fascinating to me because it plays into the whole, you know, sort of what the future is going to look like. So he, he used, my professor at university, Professor Garrick Small, we used to talk about this stuff. And he told me how, and he showed me the graphs, how there was a correlation in a lot of these empires, including the Roman Empire. And guys, you may not like these facts, but this is just, these are, this is just history. There's a decline and there's a correlation with the decline of the family unit and, you know, how the family is structured and where people are living and, you know, uh, you know, having the you know marriage or not, there's a there's a um, correlation between the decline of that and the decline of the empire, and it's amazing because it's like wow, that's what happened. Now look, it didn't happen immediately, but the after effects were seen in the centuries following, and it's amazing, and that's why I love having these discussions about history because you made the point a second ago. You're not saying that we need a war. We don't need to struggle. But this is my question. If, you know, it seems to me that in order to actually stop this cycle of, you know, going through a war every 80 years, um, we, need to, we need to make sure the kids remember the hard won, the hard won um, you know, victories that we had in the past. How do you do that? Can you simulate that? I'm not saying we should have a Hunger Games, but can you simulate that? in a way that the kids understand that so that we don't have to learn it the hard way because that's what we're going through right now, isn't it? We're learning all these lessons the hard way. I, I would love to sit here and say to you, yeah, there's a way that we can really get young people to truly appreciate how dangerous it is to become apathetic about what governments do and about the national character. But I'd be absolutely lying to you if I, if I said that there's, a, there's an obvious way. Um, the, the one thing that, look, the, the, the answer that people give when they have no answer is education. Um, but I, so I'm not going to give that answer. W what I will say is that I think there has been a game changer in the last 20 years and especially in the last 10 years. And it really is uh, social media, the internet. The, the fact is that what the printing press was in Europe in the 16th century and the way that that changed the world, changed minds, released information, broke institutional strongholds, 
the, the, the perfect modern analogy of that is the internet. And a, a great example is, is to go back to our friend Jordan Peterson. The, the cultural impact that he has had is, is really quite unbelievable. It's, it's, it's very easy to forget how people thought before Jordan Peterson. It's very easy just to think, oh, you know, people have always been skeptical about things like the gender pay gap. Oh, young people have always been talking about totalitarianism. No, they have not. They started really talking about this a lot uh, with Jordan Peterson. Uh, that's not to say no one was talking about it before then, but how many young people had heard of the Gulag Archipelago or the book 1984 before people? So the point that I'm making, Joel, is that, look, here's a very important point as well. To, to make positive change, you do not actually need a majority of people on board. As, as the very famous anthropologist Margaret Mead said, you only ever need a handful of people to, ch to change the world, to change a society. And we've got, you know, conservatives have much more than a handful. And we've, and we've got information now like we didn't have 20 years ago. We've got access to all sorts of information. And so do, do I think that we're going to be able to rouse all young people to sort of appreciate liberties and things like that? Not on your life. Do I think that we'll be able to rouse enough young people to care about these things that they can go on and tell others and that the, this core group of people can actually go on over the next 20 years and do some seriously good things? Heck yeah, I do. Because you know something? That's how history works. And um, that is just to affirm everything that I've learned over the years about how culture changes. Um, so in that respect, and, and, and this is what I said to John Anderson, when John Anderson's last question to me was, are you optimistic about the future? And, and, and I've been thinking about that for many years now, and I've decided I'm a pessimistic optimist in, in that I do actually believe things can and will get better. I do actually think more people will start caring about liberties. I do actually think people will start caring about the, the, the sort of the grounds of, of our of morality and right and wrong, which, which I believe and you believe to be God and revealed in Christ. But things will have to get worse. That's just right. how we learn as human beings. And, and that's why in, in some ways it's, it's a good thing that, that very recently governments in Australia and around the world have, have sort of been sort of casting caution to the wind like right at the beginning they're saying things like oh yeah you know two weeks to flatten the curve or oh you know let's let's try to get 80 percent vaccination come on guys get into it and okay some some pinpoint mandates here but now they're, they're just there are no pretenses now um um 95 vaccination um um health minister in new south wales uh, not being comfortable with the 5% who are unvaccinated. Now they want to vaccinate kids. And we all know that they're going to basically go down something like a mandatory path for that. It is inevitable. Um, got what, what's going on in, New, in, in Victoria with Dan Andrews, with his, um, pandemic, his pandemic management bill, absolutely ridiculous. They're casting caution to the wind. And in a sense, that's good because that, is going to wake more people up. And, and here's the thing, a lot of people, Joel, didn't want to get vaccinated. And I, and I never comment one way or the other on the efficacy or, or anything of the vaccinations. It's not my area. But a lot of people didn't want it. And they reluctantly got it. Why? Because, you know, they have to serve their families. And so they, in, in their minds, they sacrifice something for their families. Well, you know, that's what, that's what family people do. But, you know, a lot of those people, they were, they, they'd be prepared to take that vaccine for themselves. But a lot of them will say, for my kids, over my dead body. And so I, I think that, that probably the more they really overstep and the more they start coming for kids, the more you'll find people start saying, actually, you've crossed the line now. And, and it's now time for non-compliance. It's now time just to not cooperate anymore. So in, in that respect, I'm sort of a pessimistic optimist. I do think things can get better, but they're not just going to get better because we say, hey, guys, this is really bad, don't you think? No, they're going to get better because they're going to start to feel exactly what it's like when you don't care about what governments do and then governments start to take all sorts of liberties um, 
to invade your private life to sort of create some society that they think is best for everyone. 100%. And I think that's why communities are so important because when you, when you opt for a plan of non-compliance, the government, once you've tried every avenue, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now you need community and you need to build that up. Yeah. And that's why I've been really, I use the example of Tweed Heads up the coast um, with, with Graham Wood because what the guy is doing, he is creating this community around him and it's a community that works together. There's no king. It's just one of a beautiful people coming together and just supporting each other. And I thought, you know, there was a time in this country and in other countries where we didn't have government charities. We didn't have handouts. We had churches. We had communities. You know, we used to get millions of signatures on petitions, not because we had the internet back then, because we didn't. It was because we had churches and they handed around. We used to get millions of signatures. You know, we're lucky if we get... The biggest signature we've gotten in the freedom movement has been 310,000. And that was that the vaccine roller mustered here with the Nuremberg Code. And that was, that was the most we got. It's like the third biggest e-petition in Australian history. Mm. We don't have anything close to the petitions they used to get. That was the power of community back then. And I, I'm, really I, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing. It wasn't always like that. I used to be optimistic. And then, you know, from seeing what was happening in, with Trump in 2016 to 2018. And then, I, and then I got really upset with what I was saying for about a year or so. I thought, crap, we're really screwed, aren't we? But um, there are things that make me optimistic. Um, I don't know if you've heard about Generation Z in America coming out more conservative. Um, yeah. It's not what I thought it was. I thought it was because the conversations that were happening and it's yes and no. It's actually all in um, the amount of kids people are having. I was listening to Tim Poole talk about this. I don't know if we've talked about this, um, Dr. Shavira, but what was happening was in around about 2000 to 2005, there was a study that was conducted and they were trying to project, you know, where the nation would be in about 20, you know, about 15 to 20 years. And what they ended up finding was that uh, conservative parents or they ended up having kids at a rate of 2.1 per couple versus the more left, left-wing parents who they call liberals, the progressive parents, they were having them at a rate of 1.7. So they estimated that in about 15 to 20 years, they would see a situation where, you know, Generation Z would actually be just as conservative as the, ba the baby boomer generation. And that's why we call Generation Z Zoomers. And that encourages me. And that, that, ma that makes me think about the Roman Empire example, because it's like, you know, the kids are the key. You know, it, you've got to have lots of kids, guys. You know, I'm one of, actually, I shouldn't say, I can't say how many kids. I'm not one of two. I'm more than one of two kids. My mum was one of 13 kids. My dad was one of seven kids. Um, and I think it was, it was something my lecturer said where he said, um, I wish I was born in a, in a Middle Eastern community because of that community you guys have sort of molded. Lebanon's not a great, it's not a great country. They don't know how to manage anything. It's a beautiful country, but it's terribly managed. Um, but yeah, I, I think community is the way to go. And that's what makes me optimistic seeing everyone come out. Well, that may, I mean, I, I, I like that as well. But what, the, what that, for me, one of the real imperatives of conservative political activism is actually retaining the rights to be able to form our own communities and start our own institutions. And one thing that governments around the world are increasingly becoming nervous about is the, the rapid rise in homeschooling because there are a lot of people out there who are just saying, you know something, I, I don't want my kids taught by these, by, in, in these curriculums anymore. I, I'm sick of it. And they're pulling their kids out. And so the, the things that we need to fight for as conservatives, and I certainly identify as a conservative, uh, is the right just to be able to start our own things, just to be able to start our own universities, our own schools, our own homeschooling networks without governments so interfering that they make it impossible for us uh, to bring up our children and to bring up future generations um, with a kind of love for tradition, a fear, a fear of the Lord, if I can say that, and just a, 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 a sort of a commitment to basic common sense and not ideological madness. Um, that's what we've got to fight for. And, and so political activism Look, we're all becoming disillusioned with the political system, but the fact of the matter is the political system exists. It's kind of like, well, you know, you can, you can become disillusioned with gravity 
or you can figure out a way to sort of you know stay afloat um and the same thing goes with the political system you've 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 just got to deal with it you can't ignore it it's going to come after you and that's why it as cynical as as we might become about politics we still have to be involved and 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 I'm sorry to say as a as a man who wrote who co-wrote a book on Sir Robert Menzies the founder of the Liberal Party I think we're at a point now where when we just keep voting in these major parties they they're just going to say well we can do whatever the heck we want you know because and and from and and from, from I'm a lifelong lover of the Liberal Party you know I I love the party but I I just don't like where they've gone over the last 10 years and and of course they rely on guys like me saying well i got to vote liberal because if liberal don't get in labor will get in and so they kind of just think that we can do what we want because he's always going to vote for us because he doesn't want labor but the problem yeah, is yeah. now it's getting to the point where you know liberals going for zero emissions liberals are locking us up in our homes they 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 they're not they don't seem to be all that different from labor anymore it's just getting to the point where you know something if labor gets in and they're a little bit bad I can handle that if it means, you know, um candidates from United Australia Party and and other minor parties, the Christian Democratic Party, if if they get in, um I I would be prepared for Labor to come in if it meant that it sent a serious message to the Liberal Party, you seriously have to reform and it got a lot of really great minor party candidates in. And because there are some wonderful minor party candidates And I'd yeah. love to see them all. I'd love to see them all in state and federal parliament. Yeah, I think everyone would would trust any one of the minor parties um, on the conservative side over the Liberal parties right now. Um, I, even Dominic Perrette right now, he's he, he absolutely messed up. I um I wasn't planning on doing a speech yesterday, but I was called up by Mac to do to, to say something, um, and I was just saying, Dom, you really messed up. Like. he honestly had a chance to turn yeah. this around in public perception i mean he is the leader of the conservative faction of the liberal party but he has no base he has no base i don't know why he's premier like they should have got someone at least who has a base at least there's a left wing base of the liberal party he just betrayed his entire base i'm like you don't win government from the left side of the liberal party you win it from the conservative side and and he's no longer conservative um Scott Morrison who's left of Dominic Perrette he's no longer he's he's definitely not conservative and i agree i reckon if labor you know gets in but even better if there's a cross bench that can hold any government accountable we'll be in a much better position because the liberal party will be forced to they don't they never win it from the left on the liberal party they never win the election they only lose seats they have to go right that's how you know Tony Abbott won all those seats that's how you know um we had the lo- second longest serving prime minister in um John Howard um yeah. but but yeah uh, did you have anything specific you wanted to talk about that we haven't covered because i could talk forever but your time is limited and you have a lovely wife and dinner to get to <laughs> well i do have a lovely wife that's right uh thank you for <laughs> for saying um look i i mean I don't know how long we've been we we've been going for I I I really think 50 50 minutes. Well, I think that's that's probably long enough. Look, I I think all all I want to say is to people that um I do want to encourage people not to give up hope and to you know to to really uh pay attention to everything that 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 our legislators are doing and to, to as much as you can uh get educated on how to express your concerns the thing is many of us are very very concerned about what's going on but also many of us don't feel that we have the words to be able to say what our concerns are and the problem is that if you don't have the words then you don't have a voice you need words to have your voice and so i want to encourage everyone out there to keep watching uh Joel Jamal's material because it's it's very good and he gets on absolutely brilliant good looking people onto his show so keep watching uh, his show um uh if you have the time i i i i make uh, very very short videos just trying to uh, to uh, um explain things um very sharply and and so just get educated in the sense of learn to articulate and express your concerns and keep telling people why you have those concerns and and we've got to keep building this movement but but I really do think 
that it's getting to the point, and we've certainly seen this in Victoria, we're increasingly going to see it in New South Wales, where they're going to continue to overstep the line, particularly with regard to kids. Um, and I think there could be a moment coming when we have a kind of massive non-compliance, and that could be exactly what's required just to slow down the willfulness of many of our representatives um, mm. to, to basically just treat us um, like, like, like we don't have wills of our own and, and that kind of thing. So I guess I, yeah. I, I just want to encourage you all not to lose hope and to keep supporting, uh, to keep supporting one another and, um, and, and really stay active. It's easy to become cynical in the political system, but I, I would encourage you all, if you're cynical with the ma major parties, join a minor party. Um, make some changes. Uh, no one ever changed anything just by looking at it and complaining. So yeah. uh, thanks for everything you do, Joel, and I'm really honoured to be on your show. No, it's my pleasure, and it won't be the last time. We, we haven't even scratched the surface on your knowledge. Yeah. There's so many things. There's a million things we could talk about. I still want to do... A, a session with you where we talk about you know dominion voting and all of the american electoral stuff because you you've looked into that a lot so guys don't worry there's there's plenty more segments coming from uh, uh dr shavira but uh there's right now obviously we're focused on what's happening in australia but um guys before before you head off i want to plug you properly um uh dr shavira guys click this at the top left here if you're on instagram that'll drop down click follow him right now i want to get him off off uh, Twitter. I want him onto Instagram and onto Facebook. I want to build him there. It's my job to help uh, empower people that have amazing voices, that have far more knowledge than me, so we can get this message out and, and allow people to do that. If you're on Facebook, if you're on, if you're on uh, Telegram, uh, remember to click the links above. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you where to follow him. You can follow him there. And uh, don't worry, I'll get him back on and I won't, I'll make sure Big Tech doesn't get to him. But uh, Dr. Shavira, thank you again so much. You've been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to upload this everywhere. I think from judging from the comments, people have loved it. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Joel. God bless you and God bless all those who uh, were watching. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Awesome. Have a good night, guys. I'll see you later.